Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Zero Project Conference 2023. Uh, this is a, a fireside chat live here from the first day of the, uh, of the conference. And I'm, my pleasure is that I have very nice uh, guests, Sabine Lovnik to my right, welcome. And Lionel from UserWay Thank from my you. left. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, and the topic we're going to have is uh, web accessibility. So, Sabine, why don't you give you a, us a brief overview in the regulations and what, uh, what is important from the legal framework? All right. So, my name is Sabine Lumnik. I work for the Mobile and Wireless Forum, which is the association of the global mobile phone manufacturers. And telecommunications equipment providers. So, of course, that will give me a certain bias of the regulations I talk about because the devices have a search and regulatory framework and then, of course, also the content where we come into the web accessibility. So, there are two markets who have definitely regulations that have had an, an impact on the industry, which are North America and Europe. And in North America, we have already for a very long time the CVAA, so the 21st Communications and Video Accessibility Act, and with the Section 508 requirements and uh, the ADA, ADA uh, of course, as well, and certain uh, suggestions and recommendations for web accessibility, although no firm regulation yet. In Europe, we do have firm regulation, and namely the Web Accessibility Directive, which is now in force already for a few years. We also have the Public Procurement Directives, who prescribe basically that every public body who is purchasing ICT equipment needs to ensure that accessibility is taken into consideration. And coming back to the Web Accessibility Directive, that also relates to the public bodies. So that's the public sector, not yet the private sector. The private sector will be dealt with under the European Accessibility Act, which comes into force in 2025, and which will have quite, uh, will bring a lot of changes that also the customer will see. Very good, thank you. Um, Leonid, why don't you, I mean, you are come from the industry, uh, so give us a practical example uh, what you do to achieve web accessibility. Sure, so I'm. Lionel Wahlberger from uh, COO at UserWay, and I also serve on the W3C Accessibility Platform Architectures Working Group. So, uh, as you said, we have a good visibility to the challenges facing organizations meeting the regulations that Sabine described. Uh, the main challenge is to find the right people and the right tools. Uh, ICT accessibility, and particularly web accessibility, extends a broad footprint. It includes PDFs, video captions, websites, and all of these things are very fast moving. Uh, typically an organization will feel they have a solution in place, they have made their website accessible, and then the next day a new interactive object is deployed on the website or marketing changes the branding, and then the challenge starts again. So in this game of whack-a-mole, you really need a leadership that's able to bring a proper partner and to have tools because it is a challenge that requires solutions at scale. Lionel, how, how do customers find you? I mean, how, how is the approach there? So uh, there's always Google search. <laughs> uh, just search for uh, web accessibility and you'll find uh, my company, UserWay, as well as other providers. There is now a broad marketplace of solutions because as Sabine told us, regulation is only increasing globally. The uh, United States has a fairly mature environment. Uh, there are thousands of lawsuits every year to helping to drive people towards looking for solutions. So people could go to a search engine, look for web accessibility, WCAG conformance, and they'll find providers like my company, UserWay. I want to stress again, web accessibility is complicated, and it's hard to really judge quality. I mean, you might compare it to something similarly complicated like a tax audit. People need to do their taxes properly, and you need an expert sometimes. Maybe a small family can just use a cousin or uncle to do it, but certainly an organization needs an expert. 
And it's hard to tell the difference between these accessibility providers who has the proper expertise. So look at their credentials. Look if they're involved in the W3C, which makes the regulations. Look if they're certified by the global certification organizations, such as IAAP. Thank you. Sabine, thank you for the, for the overview of the, of the regulators. So what are the, the typical problems and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and structures which need to be respected from the, from the customers? So I think the first difficulty that adds to the difficulty that Lionel already outlined is that we have a whole value chain in accessibility, right? I mean, as a, as a content provider, you all only control so much. So yes, you need to make sure that, for example, the article, the PDF, the, pr um, the document that you provide, that you create is accessible but then the website where you upload it and publish it must be accessible. And then of course the device that the consumer uses to access this content must be accessible. From the consumer perspective, if on any one point the accessibility breaks, he or she will be annoyed or denied access. And also from that perspective, you cannot really trace back where the issue lies. So what we need to make sure is, first of all, to have an accessible access point. That would be, in first instance, the device, whether it's the laptop, the desktop, uh, the, mobile, the mobile phone, or the tablet. And that, of course, is the part we focus on because we come from the manufacturer's perspective. We have a database where we upload all that information and where we invite consumers to go and identify an accessible device. Then we need to make sure that the apps that you upload, that you populate the device with, are accessible. Um, the manufacturers already guide and push developers in a certain direction to try to make sure that the accessibility is not broken. So today, when you, when you follow the web developer guidelines of the big platforms, you're already on a safe side. But then, of course, the content that you access needs to be accessible as well. So from the consumer perspective, it doesn't matter where accessibility breaks. It's important that the whole value chain follows the regulations and recommendations and provides an accessible experience. Thank you. Lionel, what be, would be a, a, a practical example of uh, what do people, customers want from you? An accessible website or how, how, and also would be interesting what's the different profile of small versus big companies? That's a great question. Uh, we can divide the customers into two broad baskets. There are customers that all have literally no developer resources in-house. They made the website by some external team and it's, it's uh, managed at arm's length and they have little to no control over the accessibility of that asset. These customers uh, would like an automated solution that automatically remediates everything quickly uh, and today there are solutions like that. They're called overlays with one line of JavaScript. You can remediate the uh, issues, many of the issues on the site. And that's one of UserWay's most popular solutions for this type of customer. And we're trusted on over one million websites. The other basket would be the large organization that has multiple uh, access points. And as Sabine indicated, has huge supply chains that are generating this content. Those customers really need to just get solidly in place an annual audit cadence done by experts. And again, UserWay provides this. All the major providers provide this. An audit that accesses the content and assesses it according to the relevant standard, which is generally WCAG 2.1 AA. This way, uh, the organization can get visibility. And I guess that's the short answer to the question. The, the stakeholder needs to understand, do they have a problem? Accessibility is, uh, is, is not readily detectable. Uh, a, a surprising statistic that we ran into recently uh, in our designers course. So again, I like Sabine's way of thinking about it as supply chain. We don't generally look at it that way, but it is a chain. And in that chain, you have uh, product definition, design, content authoring, development, and then the back ends that support. All these things, as Savine said, need to be accessible and they each have different needs and approaches. We recently gave our designers course, which is uh, very popular, uh, where you add annotations to the design to ensure that the design carries the correct semantics down that supply chain. So that a design that looks like a button 
gets identified semantically as a button for the device to interpret it properly as a button, and that's one example. What we found in preparing for that, we did our annual visit to the major design sites. More than half of the current most favored designs were completely inaccessible. The colors. Color contrast has been a well understood problem since the beginning of our accessibility journey, and still the award winning designs fail on color contrast. That just shows you the magnitude of our challenge. Let us take me uh, to the customer journey. So the customer finds you, uh, the, we have the problem, we have the solution, and then you say it's basically a, a recurring, it's a process which has to be managed over, it's an, an unlimited time because requirements change and, uh, and people need to come back. So uh, to what extent are you a solution provider and to what extent are you also a consultant? The, uh, the full solution is to provide both consulting and services. If, a, if there's one takeaway, I would take away is that you need a person, consulting, leadership, talent, and tools. So to answer your question, I pointed out these two baskets, the small, medium business, or it could be a business with a huge, a billion dollar year revenue, but still fits this profile of having one major digital asset that they manage at arm's length or a large company with many digital assets, many ICT assets that need accessibility and taking it seriously. So let's look at that journey to answer your question. The small and uh, medium business or the, could be a large revenue but has a, a few digital assets, they engage with UserWay and they select the automated products first of all because the automation gives them good coverage and they can rest easy that they are much more conformant and accessible than they were before they started. This also gives them a doorway to visibility because a good automated remediator like UserWay's AI-powered widget gives a view to the stakeholders on how compliant they are. And it will reflect to them what's been solved by automation and what does need to be solved with code or content changes. From the other point of view, for the large organization, the first step is to put in a, a, an audit. And here I would say the success pattern that we see is not to bite the whole thing off in one go. Very often the organization comes in, they finally recruited the budget for this task, and they order a huge audit of multiple assets. That then becomes a challenge to the development cycle because you then get thousands of tickets that need actioning. And that can be overwhelming for the development teams. So a best practice for even the largest organizations is to take a sample project, a sample um, digital asset that's, that's public facing, do an audit of that, and at the same time, purchase the knowledge and training that you'll need to bring your teams up to speed, and a regular management cadence with our experts to help you formulate policy. We sometimes talk about the middle manager. I watch the comedy series, The Office, and there's Dwight Schrute, and he's completely helpless to get anything done. And we think of him because we often work with a middle manager. Somebody from compliance just calls and says, we need to be accessible. I saw the Zero Project ad. I'm very inspired. Make it accessible. But the middle manager has a very limited scope. He gets constantly changing branding, constantly changing digital assets. But the one thing the middle manager can do is put in an automated solution like I suggested, because at least then he knows where he stands. Very good, thank you. So, Vinny, you, you described the manufacturing process. Um, how much I is driven by uh, the legal framework and how much is driven by, by demand from pressure groups, from peer groups, from the market, under quotes? So I cannot really tell you what was the very first thing, right? Because uh, I'm not so firm on when the CVA in the US was introduced. And I think that was the first legal framework really right. prescribing mobile, rec um, mobile accessibility requirements. So I'm not sure if the manufacturers were first or if the legislation were first. Uh, I would say they are mutually beneficial. Uh, but in any case, we have now the GARI database for 15 years, right? So 15 years ago, we already were at the point where we had a lot of accessibility features built in that were also demanded by the community, but the large majority of the end consumer didn't know about it. So in terms of who was first, who really gave the impetus to start on the journey, I, I cannot tell you. Uh, I would have to ask my colleagues who were there the first day. Uh, 
But fact is that this is really, that is an area that has gained a lot of momentum. And the manufacturers are constantly, like in every new software update that you get today, you also get an update and improvement on the accessibility features. Even to the point where we have some of the um, large scale or mainstream consumer electronics that move more and more even into assistive technology space. So we have a large uh, suit of different accessibility features. That said, we have the technology, we have the solutions. We still have an information problem, like on uh, what the situation that Lionel described, right, in the company where you lack expertise. We also have a lack of information understanding on the end consumer side. Almost, I mean, at least in our countries, almost everyone has a very powerful device in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And like with our brain, we use it to a capacity of 5 to 10 percent, right? And in particular, in the accessibility space, I would say maybe 1 percent. Mm -hmm. In Gary today, we list 135 accessibility features that almost every smartphone has. But how many do you use, <laughs> Lionel? How many do you use, Wilfried? And then in particular, older citizens, you know, or, or people that are in between that space of not needing any assistive technology and needing specialized technology. In that space, we have no help, right? Many people don't know that there are features on their phone that can help them to look better, uh, to see better, to hear better, to understand better with the device. So we have the solutions. We have a lot of accessibility features. Now we need to educate the end consumer on what is there and what they can use. May I? Of course. Um, when you mentioned the 135 features and their low take-up rate, you remind me of an interesting debate in our community. Um, UserWay was one of the companies with first out with an accessibility widget where you can click, for example, and change the size of text. Now, this caused some vigorous debate in the community because people said, well, that's already built into the browser. That's already built into the operating system. That's already built into the smartphone. Putting it there, available on the page in front of the user, is uh, in some sense not needed according to that position. But we feel, just as Sabine pointed out, that people don't know how to dig into the operating system. Offering more choices does not prevent that. And that's why UserWay's accessibility widget and others like it offer all these choices that are indeed available elsewhere. Like uh, even a screen reader is available on our product. Uh, um, a uh, color contrast, dark mode, light mode, larger and smaller fonts. While these are available elsewhere, Making them more and more available, it's kind of like uh, the coffee and water stations here. They're outside almost every room. You want to show people and slowly educate that these options are available. Offering more paths to enable accessibility doesn't stop, doesn't block any path. It just raises awareness. You're watching the session on web accessibility. I'm, I'm joined here with Sabine Lobnik and uh, Lionel Waldberger. It's a very interesting uh, discussions. Sabine, you mentioned before uh, the European Accessibility Act. So is a, a big sword hanging upon us. Uh, you know, fight our fear. Tell us what uh, what we need to expect. Well, it depends. Are you the consumer or industry? <laughs> it's a huge difference in perspective. Let's let's, <laughs> let's start from the consumer. Okay, so for the consumer, you know, I mean, a lot of the legislation or regulation that we mentioned, the consumer doesn't see hands-on, right? Because usually the accessibility should be there. The consumer should not have to go check whether the WCAG um, points have all been followed, right? But the European Accessibility Act will bring differences on the, um, on the visible side, right? On the public interface. In that, for example... The, the Act prescribes you need to have accessible information on accessibility features. That is really new. For us, it's great. We have tried to push that forward for 15 years, right? Because as I mentioned, the end consumer does not know what's possible. So if I don't know what's possible, I cannot ask for it because it's not even in my headspace. So accessible information on accessibility features, what does this mean? We expect that it will be much more present. We don't know which form it will take in the end concretely because the standards are being developed, but it will be prominent. It will be very present. From the industry perspective, the, market, um, the ex uh, European Accessibility Act is a market access directive. That is huge for us because it means you cannot put the devices or any product that falls under the act 
on the European market without complying with the accessibility requirements. That is a very powerful regulation, so that will ensure that all the ICT devices from 2025 onwards will comply with accessibility regulations, uh, accessibility requirements as outlined in the Act. And in the Act, just to give a short notice, um, it follows functional performance criteria. So there are things that you need to be able to use the device without sight, without hearing, without mobility. So this is very general. Of course, it is broken down that into very specific requirements, but it should ensure that the devices can really be used by the largest possible user base out there. And just a question for the implementation. I remember the, the big data protection issues we had uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, will there be grace periods or will there be fines or what, uh, what's going to happen? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, well, we don't know because it enters into force 2025, right? But hugely important for us as industry speaking is that we have harmonized standards in place. What does that mean? That means we have a standard that says very specifically what you need to do to be compliant with the regulation. If we don't have that standard, then you know the current text is, as I mentioned, you need to be able to use it without sight. That is very much open to interpretation. So we hope to have the standards in place by 2025. That means we have a very clear path of being compliant with the regulation. If that is not the case, then there will be some negotiations going on. <laughs> and so the la la last question, is this mandatory for all member states or is there, uh, do they have an implementation time frame? No. No, the implementation, as so the, um, the period for transposing it into national law has already expired. Okay. Right. So theoretically, it should already be in national law everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have quite a number of member states, including <laughs> Austria, who are a little bit behind. But they are working on it and the texts are underway. But no, in that sense, there is no grace period because the transposition period has expired. And now we have until 2025 to comply with um, the regulations and really implement it in the market. Thank you. Uh, let's cover another aspect, uh, Lionel. Uh, we come now from you know, legal uh, frameworks, from manufacturing, from, uh, from let's say consumer pressure. But what is the practical advantage to have a barrier-free and an accessible, uh, you know, documents, internet, phone. Barrier-free, uh, barrier-free assets for an organization means more customers, and in the end, more profit. Uh, accessibility pays for itself. When we convey this to our customers, we talk about the six C's. It sounds like sexy, but it's six C's, <laughs> the letter C. Uh, that cost, yes, there is cost, but you'll find in the long run that it's offset by the increased traffic and sales that the company experiences, as well as more positive sentiment uh, from its um, customer base. Coverage is the second C there, you, as I mentioned before. Don't just think of your website. Don't just think of the mobile app. Think of the videos that are coming out, the, the tweets that are going on social media. There's broad coverage and many different assets that need to be kept in mind. The communication, communicating internally to the company about accessibility goals and then communicating externally. As we mentioned before, actually showing on your website that you are committed to accessibility, having the universal symbol of accessibility can drive powerful sentiment and in the end, increased sales. The last three C's, I'll go a little quicker. Continuity, that's a big problem. Going back to my friend Dwight Trute, he really suffers from a lack of continuity. It's a year-over-year -year challenge, and it just needs to get baked into corporate policy. Uh, it's just another checkpoint, and uh, in the end, we don't think it'll be a monster under the bed. We think uh, it, it actually is a checkpoint that you can feel very good about. Uh, those organizations that have disabled people within their employee population have uh, employee resource groups, and that is a tremendous source of motivation to keep the continuity going. The last two C's are compliance, we covered the regulation, and the last one is consulting. You need access to experts, uh, and also this is driving new employment for people with disabilities. There's tremendous opportunity in this new market. 
And that cycles back to where I opened, people and tools. Watch for tools that enable more people with disabilities to engage on the conformance process. Companies like UseAway are opening new interfaces so that it's easy for people with limited training to come in and make sure that assets are accessible. Let's be optimistic. Let's uh, assume we have converted somebody uh, that's accessible and barrier-free is, is absolutely fantastic to have. So yeah. what's, uh, what, what's the first step? What, uh, where shall I start? Another C for conversion. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So, yeah, I would assume or I would hope that we have everyone convinced, definitely. Then it depends on where you stand and what you want to do, right? So, hmm. if I'm... Okay, let's go with the end consumer, right? So we haven't convinced him, but we have informed him or her that there is something like accessibility, an accessible device that just helps you, that helps you access whatever you need to do. Um, then we would direct them first, of course, to the GARI database. You can go online. It's www.gari.info. Uh, it's available in 20 languages. And there you can start with identifying an accessible device or just getting an idea of what the devices can do because you can look at the list of features and you get a short explanation of what that feature can help you with. <coughs> the next step would be with the accessible device um, to, well, of course, to access content. And in our journey of getting better in accessibility, I would recommend that maybe you start with the videos provided by the IAEP, which Lionel already mentioned, which is the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And of course, this is, as the name already says, it's, it's targeted to professionals, but it can be a first step on getting educated, getting information, getting orientation, right? Because we mentioned if you start out with it and you just Google it, you have a wealth of information, you just don't know where to start, you're overwhelmed, you might turn away. But no, go to IAP, get a first overview, and then you see, depending on what you want to do, what is your job, what is your purpose, who do you work with, there they can orient you in uh, a certain stream where you get the information that you need to, provide, uh, to move forward on that journey. And then afterwards, I mean, you can do certifications, you can become a web, um, web accessibility expert yourself, but the first steps should be simple, you know, yeah. and that gets you started. Lionel, brief, brief one on the 7C. Yeah, start <laughs> simple, and I love that you gave your URL, so I'll give mine. <laughs> Userway.org is a great place to start. You'll find there a full set of solutions. Uh, and uh, what I would add, I I'm afraid there were so many initials going by, IAAP, the name of your consortium, uh, but I do need to add W3C. So there, there's the Web Accessibility Initiative, which we and W3C are very proud of. It started 20 years ago, and its success is mind-blowing. The standard curated by that community, the WCAG, has become the reference for all these uh, regulations that we've mentioned. So W3C is still working, so you can also add that to your alphabet soup the WAI, and uh, UserWay's uh, employees, we are members, and we contribute actively there. Uh, keep it simple. I, I love that. Uh, start somewhere. And you mentioned the difficulty in search. So I would say if you are searching, look for WCAG Audit. Uh, and there, when you contact an auditor, ask if they do it in-house. You want a company that actually does the audit, doesn't outsource it to some audit farm. Very good. Uh, we have Petra here, who has been drawing in the background. Uh, we try to run an accessible conference, and uh, Petra does graphic facilitation. So what did we talk about? <laughs> okay. Accessibility in the web. What an important topic we always cover here in the Zero Project. Um, so the web should be accessible for everyone. We know that. But how do you do it, and why do we do it? Let's start with the why. The why are two reasons. First of all, the customers need it. We need accessibility for customers, from customers. And there's legislation already in place and coming up, as far as we heard. So there are two really good reasons to do that. Um, the big thing is to see the big picture, to see the whole process, to keep the customer in mind. And we heard there are two types of customers in two baskets, as you said. Um, it could be a small business, a one-person business, or it could be a large corporation. 
So depending on the need or the problem of our customer, the developer serves the solution, always keeping this, these needs in mind. Um, so web accessibility, like any other program development, starts here with the customer. So start simple, start with the customer, make sure that your programs, your information is user friendly. And we heard that you have to follow the supply chain or the value chain. So it starts with accessible information in the beginning. And then we develop the program, then we program the program, <laughs> um, and then it must be accessible on all the different devices, phones and computer screens and wherever that might be. Um, and then again, we end at a happy customer who could be a small business or a large corporation. There are a lot of challenges on the way. Um, two I grasped um, that could be summarized at high pace. It's a very fast changing topic. So content changes quickly, but also the technology changes quickly. So you have a solution and three days later somebody's there and says, hey, I got a new idea. So you always have to adapt. Um, we heard a few tricks and I will finalize the summary with that. First of all, you have to integrate the people the, who represent the users at the end into your development. So you need people, you need educated people, you need experts, and you need the tools. So you have to watch out for the right tools to overcome those challenges. And the sexies <laughs> to remember <laughs> are cost, coverage, uh, communication, continuity, uh, compliance, and consulting. I hope I got it basically <laughs> all together. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. your great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you have been watching uh, our session here from the Zero Project Conference 2023 on web accessibility. Thank you, Sabinis. Thank you, Lionel. And uh, keep on watching the Zero Project Conference 2023. Thank you. <laughs>